On this visit to the film lounge, an uncomfortable conversation goes from bad to worse. A lone lighthouse keeper signals the end of an era. A student filmmaker shares her winning entry. A driven skater tests the limits of endurance. A music video summons a world of fun. And we celebrate five years at the film lounge by catching up with past filmmakers. Suit up for another cinematic deep dive here at the film lounge. Funding for the Film Lounge has been provided by Produce Iowa, building a statewide network of support for the film community in Iowa. More information on how you can connect is available at produceiowa.com. And Iowa Arts Council, empowering Iowa to build and sustain culturally vibrant communities by cultivating creativity, learning, and participation in the arts. Learn more at iowaculture.gov. I'm Justin Norman. I'm a filmmaker from Des Moines, Iowa, and my film is Enjoy Your Evening. When I was younger, you know, I played music a lot, and that was the thing that I did outside of work that made me really happy. That was a great way to do something creative with other people. And then, you know, as I've gotten older, and it's less of a, I guess, less common to be in a band with a bunch of people around my age. Um, I've just switched over to filmmaking and we've got a consistent group of people that all enjoy it. So we've done about 50 comedy shorts. <laughs> well, uh, enjoy your evening and uh, I'm sure. Enjoy Your Evening is about two guys that get out of a job interview. So one guy really wants this job and the guy he's interviewing with is kind of dangling it in front of him and they have the experience that so many of us have had where they say goodbye and then they begin walking toward their cars and then they decide uh, they discover that they have uh, quite a long walk together to to get to their vehicles so they have to continue to make small talk on the way and the guy who wants the job Doug uh, has to kind of suffer through trying to tolerate uh, the conversations that my character, Carl, is trying to start with him. Uh, it's, a, it's a great night out. Mm -hmm. Great night for a game. <laughs> yeah. This seemed to naturally fit into a sketch comedy structure normally. And when you're doing sketch comedy, you do three or four iterations of the same joke. So if that experience was repeated several times, it seems like um, it could get both funnier and possibly scarier the longer it went. I think that the way that I end up scoring my comedies is a fairly different from the way I see a lot of comedies scored. Uh, a lot of comedies are scored very lighthearted and I like to score the comedies uh, as if they're dramas and have the music kind of play a straight man role. Popular place. <laughs> you could say that. Creating a, a, an environment of seriousness where all of the unusual dialogue can, can happen and that's, that's where the humor's at and the cinematography, the editing, and the music is all kind of just a straight man for the, the strange characters and dialogue. <laughs> okay. All right, well, uh, it was great meeting you, and learning about your company, Carl. I think you might be the one. Oh, God, you didn't hear that? <laughs> Look, uh, we're still considering a few other candidates, but between you and me, I think you're the right kind of cheddar to make Papa's little rodents squeal like the midnight banshees they are. You catch my drift? Uh, I think I do. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, enjoy your evening, and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch. Yeah? Mm hmm. Can't wait to feel it. Your touch. You know, I'm gonna reach out about the oh, job. Yeah, of course, right. <laughs> Oh, just uh, park this way. Too. Oh, of course. 
Yeah. It's a, it's a great night out. Mm -hmm. Great night for a game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you you follow the follow the ball. Yeah. Yeah, I do. God, I love Mason Ball. Jeez, Doug, you really get it, don't you? Yeah. That's great. Love it. Well, uh, hey, enjoy your evening. Uh, it was so nice to meet you. It really was. Uh, yeah. It really has. Yeah. So good, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> Just step in the uh, old oh. parking garage here. Yeah. Um, popular place. <laughs> <laughs> you could say that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Oh. Take me out to did you hear that? Uh, take take me out to the ball game. Timeless classic. Me and my boys uh, we recorded a cover of it. Cool. Yeah, it is. It's pretty cool. I, you know, I got a nephew. He's uh, he's really big into ball. <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah, my nephews can't get enough of them ball boys. Yeah, I, I really like to see him smile, you know, when they get the points. <laughs> yeah, yeah, makes me want to throw back a cold one. Do you like cold ones? I uh, love cold ones. All right, uh, enjoy your evening then. Oh, are you? <laughs> I certainly will, Douglas. Might even throw back a cold boy in your honor. <laughs> oh, I thought you were taking the stairs. Nah, the stairs are all broken. The stairs are what? Yeah, seems like maybe these construction devils uh, they are as fond of cold boys as you and I are, and they get a little bit randy on the job. Oh, that, that doesn't make party press. It's that creepy up here, right? Uh, don't you need to take that? Oh, no, no, I don't want to be worried. I'm talking to you. <laughs> you remind me of a friend I had last week. Also named Doug. Also big in a ball. You know what he was really into? Crock-pot cooked venison. Yeah. Bought this beautiful Cuisinart cooker. He was taking it back home through this very same parking garage we're in right now. These uh, bloodthirsty muggers sprang from the shadows, knives glistening and all that. Tell him that He's got to give them his car, or they'll stab his eyes out. But they don't. They don't stab his eyes out. Uh, just take the Cuisinart and uh, caved his skull. Jesus. They murdered him with a Cuisinart. That's fucked up, right? That's why I bought this, uh, this knife to protect myself. I, I, no, I know what you're thinking. I, I don't want to be paranoid or anything like that, but just, you know. Okay, all right. Well, enjoy your evening. Okay. You too. You enjoy. I didn't mean to. Are you serious right now? You're parked in this row? Yeah. It's kind of crazy, I guess. Yeah, that is kind of crazy. Which Which one is your car? This is my car, Douglas. This is my car, Carl. Okay, well, calm down. We can both have the same car. Uh, what? I... If it's your car, then unlock it.
Doug, if this is about you wanting to give the old girl a spin, then that's fine with me. Do you want to get in? It's a Prius, Carl. I don't want to give the old girl a spin. If it's your car, unlock it. As the proximity sensor. Keyless entry is great. It's my keyless entry. Look, Doug, I thought that you were the perfect candidate for this job, but this whole thing with the car is weird. Now I'm gathering that you clearly lack the foresight to display your parking permit properly, and you got yourself towed, right? So do you want to stand there mocking your potential employer's gas-efficient, environmentally friendly car, or want to ride home? What do you say? Long day, huh? I cannot wait to get home, flip on the tee, kick back a few cold boys, and catch an eye full of ball. <laughs> Where am I uh, taking you? 311 East 13th Street. <laughs> no way! <laughs> I know that place! Oh, wow. I bet that's your place, too, huh? And you're just gonna walk right in and and eat my brisket, and wrestle my boys, and French kiss my wife? What? Why the hell would I wrestle your boys, Douglas? I live over on East 12th. He screwed up, all right? He screwed up real bad. In honor of my friend Doug, other Doug, who is dead, I won't say anything to corporate. If you get out of this car right now, Ten out of ten meeting, but the ride home was a big zero. I thought we were closest to. Not we got closer than before, but all I got was the car. Prius. Jesus, what happened? He went for the car, but he wasn't going for the whole house and wife bit. So, no wrestling his boys. No. There's no way we're getting that guy's Netflix password. My name is Jack Sarcone. I'm from Des Moines, Iowa, and my film is Salt and Sea. So this is a documentary about one of the last lighthouse keepers left in the world. Um, there aren't any left in the United States, so this was an adventure out to Ireland to find one of less than a dozen lighthouse keepers that are still there. The life of a lightkeeper. 
I found Gerald online. Um, he has a website and a book that's out about his life. So I read his book um, and then reached out to him and became kind of pen pals with him up until uh, I met him in Ireland. Gerald is an amazing subject. Um, he had so much wisdom, had such an amazing life that he's really someone from history that's living now. I had sat down with him for a couple sessions, about two hours at a time, and just let him tell everything, his whole story, the history of Irish lighthouses, um, the future of them, and just his thoughts, and contextualize this lifestyle um, with his life and what it was like um, for, to kind of preserve that lifestyle. I went with my sister. Um, we stayed at the lighthouse for three days. Um, which I'm glad it was three days, it was just enough time, but also each day was completely different weather. Um, all I brought was a small mirrorless camera and a tripod and a shoulder rig and a microphone and recorder. So it was a really running gun and I just locked down shots and made sure, focused on my compositions and I let the Irish landscape tell its story as well. I was quite happy to be there. I had the sound and the, the look and the feel was just kind of a natural, organic thing. I didn't really spend too much time in post mixing and mastering the soundscape. It just kind of happened as it was. I didn't add anything. I wanted to keep it as organic as possible. Here I'm more of a simplistic, minimalist filmmaker, so just kind of using one song to come back to and make it more of a pensive, contemplative piece, um, I think really made sense with this as kind of a piece about isolation and finding peace within that and the end of an era as it was. A lighthouse is alive. The lighthouse stands there and it defies the weather to attack it. It stands up to all the elements and it's performing its own duty, keeping that light or making sure that the light shines out. Yes, the keeper has to do his work, but the lighthouse is there doing its own thing, what it was made to do. So, um, yeah, a lighthouse has a life of its own. My name is Gerald Butler and um, I'm a light keeper, or was a light keeper. I'm the uh, third generation, my father and both of my grandparents were uh, light keepers in the Irish Lights. Uh, this is where I grew up, this was our family home. Uh, my father was the light keeper here and uh, it was great living here. He was at, at home with us, so we were a complete family unit um, living and working away here. The life of a lightkeeper. It's a sedentary way of life. You're very isolated in it, so you're very cut off from uh, the general public. It's something that I was kind of used to, but still and all, you really don't know it properly until you experience it. And I can remember when I landed on Inish Tirith. When the helicopter left the rock, the isolation was colossal. You were on this rock, and there was no getting off of it. You know, there was a, a part of your mind wanted to be at home or wanted to be somewhere else and y you needed to detach. And detaching takes a little bit of time. For me, that was never an overriding feeling because I was quite happy to be there. I had an adventurous enough spirit so climbing, um, exploring was fantastic. 
when I was out on a rock, uh, I completely lost sense of time. You'd know the time you were coming on watch and going off watch, and you'd know when the watches were changing at the end of the week. Uh, it allowed me great time to read, uh, great time to grow inwardly, um, to get an understanding of life itself. When I look at uh, what's happening around me, every wave that'll strike the rock, that's been going on for millions of years. So you can sit and look at that and know that your time here is just a drop in the ocean. There are stories attached to these places. Uh, there are histories um, buried in each of these lighthouses. Uh, incidences that happened, such as the passing of the Lusitania. I remember reading in a book one time where a young boy might ask his father, what were those things? Automation really changed the entire face and use of lighthouses. The motto of the Irish Lights was in salutem omnium, for the safety of all. So that was why we were here. We were here and um, we were offering navigational aids. We were also keeping a watch out for anybody who got into difficulty. And yes, uh, we were living up to that. That was for the safety of all. But now the automation program came in and the demanning that went with that. So the motto has changed. And personally to me, I feel that's awful. It's awful to change that motto. And I think uh, it's been truthful to change it. I think they have to change it because now uh, lighthouses are no longer there for the safety of all. It's up to a ship to provide its own safety. The RNLI, the lifeboats, and the Coast Guard are here to help. Um, but lighthouses are not keeping an eye out anymore. I am eternally grateful that I was born into this and that in this time that I, I've come to serve as a lightkeeper. Looking back on it, no, I would never have been anything else. A businessman, forget it. <laughs> a farmer, maybe, but I don't think so. There's too much salt water in my uh, past, in my blood, in my system uh, to allow me to be anything else. I really um, appreciative that I've had uh, the opportunity to live the life I've lived. I'm Elisa Lavrenko. I am a senior from Postville High School, and I'm a dancer, theater geek, and aspiring filmmaker. Pressure Point is a ballet film that showcases the practice of ballet going from studio to stage. 
The most difficult part about making my film was, since I was also acting in the film as well as directing it, it was really um, a struggle relaying my vision for the film to someone else. So having the person filming me stand in a specific way or getting exact camera angles and showing what I wanted in the film. I think the most rewarding was showing the true art of ballet. Ballet has always been a part of me. I'm really passionate about it. So it was really personal to me that I could show the dedication and work that goes into making a good ballet performance. Making the film on its own was a reward. I just really was happy to participate, but receiving top honors just really encouraged me to pursue filmmaking as my career. I plan to attend University of Iowa to major in cinema. So after that, I'd like to work with videography and cinematography. Sometimes I just make films for fun for myself, so I will make short montages of either nature or me hanging out with my friends. But currently I'm working on a short film for a speech contest, so I'm working on that with my classmates and right now we're figuring out a storyline, getting ideas, and we'll see where it goes from there.
Hey, I'm Caitlin Busby, and I was featured on the Film Lounge in 2017 with my dance film, Introspect. And again in 2018 with my documentary, Paintalica. Get up. So since my appearance on the Film Lounge, a lot has changed. I've moved to New York City and I started an MFA at Tisch School of the Arts in their graduate film program. And I'm currently in year two. I shot my first film for grad school called Stop Gap. It's a four minute long black and white film shot on 16 millimeter film without any dialogue. Stop Gap is about a high school senior struggling with the harsh new reality of being forced to live out of her mom's car. So my second film for grad school is a short observational character study documentary called Behind the Eye. And I got to come back to Iowa and shoot that over this last winter break. It follows an incredible woman, Lindsay Pronk, who works up at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics. And she's an ocularist. And what that means is she creates prosthetic eyes individually tailored to every single one of her patients. So my third film in grad school happened right on the onset of the pandemic. And we were scheduled to shoot uh, short fictional seven minute long narrative films in New York City. And then the pandemic struck and New York City went into lockdown and my program went entirely remote. And so my partner Brennan and I decided to pack up our car and head back to Iowa. And so I made a film about a young man traveling from his home, New York City, back to Iowa to uh, shelter in place during the pandemic at his empty family home. And he's trying to navigate this world of chaos and isolation and do it without totally losing his mind, as I think many of us experienced during that period of time. While being back, I've had the opportunity to collaborate uh, with a lot of my favorite Iowa filmmakers and also safely work on film projects. And uh, I really look forward to bringing back as many films as possible to Iowa and um, making art happen here with people that I love. Hi, my name is Charles Christie and my films Flava and The Spaceman were featured on the Film Lounge and my film Black Star was featured on the Film Lounge Halloween style. Since I've been on the Film Lounge, I've been taking my work out on the film festival circuit, which has been super fun and really rewarding because you get to A, put your film up on the big screen for people to see, and B, you get to meet a lot of fellow filmmakers. So that's an experience that I've really enjoyed doing, uh, you know, since I've been on the show. Uh, outside of that, the only project I've really worked on is called Miles, a Spider-Man fan film. And that was by far the biggest project I've ever had to make. It took almost a year from shoot to editing and it was uh, a super big learning experience you know just to bring all that together you know make Iowa look like New York uh, it was crazy fun and I love doing it um, but after doing that I've kind of just taken um, you know a backseat to filmmaking more so just working on writing uh, visual effects editing just because with the pandemic uh, you know putting together shoots can be kind of dangerous and hard to do. So I decided just to kind of take a, uh, you know, a little break to recharge. Um, but that's all I've really been up to. I hope you enjoyed checking in with me and I hope you enjoy the rest of the film lounge. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bruce James Bales. I'm from Bedenorf, Iowa, currently reside in Des Moines, Iowa, and the film I'm gonna be talking about is Ultra. When I get a script or an idea in my inbox or in, you know, put in my hands, the first thing that attracts me is the story. Is, is the story good? Do I identify with the story? Can I see the story coming to life visually? Also, there are projects that I like doing just because someone's involved. Maybe it's a director I like working with, maybe it's an actor that I've really wanted to work with, but also uplifting stories, stories of uh, humans overcoming themselves, overcoming obstacles. So those things have really informed my style, I think. Ultra is a documentary short that focuses on my friend Caleb Smith and his personal and physical journey rollerblading from San Francisco to Los Angeles down Pacific Coast Highway 1 in California. Um, this is a trip that Caleb's wanted to do for some time, so we were with him for a week documenting his journey down this beautiful coastal highway, um, and it's really a, a story of his own personal journey, overcoming himself um, to do something that is 
both physically demanding and mentally demanding. So in all honesty, I had my doubts about him being able to complete it. I think it's a really good marriage of mind and body. Pacific Coast Highway 1, there is a uh, level of danger there. Um, Caleb had never seen it. He had never been on that road. I had driven it and known the <laughs> just sheer amount <laughs> of turns and cliffs and, and watching him do that was inspiring and gave me a love for life and a love for rollerblading um, that is really hard to put into words because when you see someone that you love and care about push themselves like that and achieve this goal and how much it meant to them, it really hit you. And uh, watching him do that was, it was an emotional journey for me as well. What if this is not possible and I do fail and people see that failure? Ultimately, when you're on a film set where everyone is serving the story and everything is firing all cylinders, it's such a beautiful, magical thing. And that's the magic of filmmaking that I love and that feeling of seeing everybody come together for this one cause. It's just, it's honestly the most beautiful thing. What's up, my name's Caleb Smith. I am here at the Golden Gate Bridge because I'm getting ready to ultra skate from San Francisco all the way to Los Angeles, California. I'm gonna be spending roughly seven to 10 days skating down California Coastal Highway 1. I'll roughly be skating around 472 miles, but with trips like this, it varies from day to day. Sometimes you have more miles than you would have thought or less miles. So it's really a discover as you go kind of thing. I think my favorite part is, is as soon as you get out on the road, those first few strides, when it's dawning on you that you're about to take on this extreme challenge, and you just feel this new sense of freedom. You're about to go on this adventure and discover so much, and it just fills you with like a really wonderful sense of energy and a connection with yourself mentally, spiritually, and physically. I'm in Half Moon Bay. I did 30 miles yesterday, which was a good start. A lot of climbing and a lot of just getting used to what I think the trail is gonna be like. I'd say 70% of it, the shoulders were pretty smooth and four, you know, four foot average shoulder, so I had enough room to stride comfortably. Traffic's right there, but when you have the wide shoulder, it's not really ever scary. There were a few parts going up some of the steeper hills where there was no shoulder. And I sort of had to like skip along in the openings of the traffic so there'd be a big group of traffic and then I'd jump on and I'd skate 100, 150 yards if I could and then jump off the road again. And that can be cumbersome, but that's just going up the big hills. Once I got to the top, it was awesome. I mean, it was, it was cruising down those hills. of the craziest miles of my whole life. <laughs> 3,000 foot of elevation gain, just like insane curving mountains on cliffs against the ocean. Uh, 
that I've never experienced. I've never skated anything like that ever before. For real, that was like the craziest hills I've ever skated. I mean, super steep, so long, like multiple miles long, like three mile long downhill it felt like. Just like you're going forever and the, the weight of your pack is carrying you and you're going, I was going as fast as traffic and just like ripping it. It definitely puts me in the state of Zen. It's like... You get your body in motion and you have to keep your thoughts in motion too because like one can so easily dismantle the other. If like you let your thoughts get crazy or stop you, your body wants to stop. So if you keep the thoughts positive and if you keep them kind of flowing, keep your energy in motion, your body stays in motion easier. I think it's a really good marriage of mind and body. You can't be super strong and not have the mind to do it. And obviously you can have all the mind in the world and you need some sort of athleticism and discipline to be able to do it. I wanna do it because for as much as I believe it's possible, I always have a slight, I always have a fear and a doubt that I won't make it. And I love overcoming that. I love the feeling of achieving something that has terrified me, that I thought about for so long, that I thought, what if this is not possible? And I do fail, and people see that failure. And that's been a good learning experience for me. And I like that that's a driving factor for me is that I'm not having to beat anyone else. I'm always beating myself. And I feel like each time I grow stronger and I, that's something that I haven't found in a lot of other places in life. And I really enjoy that. Being able to step off the road into nature and experience that and all the force that it is makes all the struggle of the day kind of melt away. When you skate this distance and then you take your skates off and you step onto the ocean front, it feels as if those waves kind of wash away all the struggle and all the pain of that day. And you just get to admire the beauty of what the world is and that Having an off day to be able to rest and prepare for the next few days and to be able to hike and see nature just makes, makes it all tie in together to be, I think, what an ultra skating journey is. What's up, guys? for two days, insane hills, no service, so really mentally isolated, but everything out here is like so beautiful and so silently powerful that even though you're all alone, you don't feel alone. day nine 
I'm about 90 miles from Los Angeles. It has been an extreme mental and physical battle to get here, but I am, I think, over the hump in the home stretch. I feel good physically, mentally. I'm excited, I'm ready. I look forward to today's skate. It's gonna be the last big skate of the trip. I'm in Los Angeles, California. I just skated here from Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, California. I left 10 days ago. Every, every brutal moment that like was almost gonna stop me, like the only thing in my head was, was the things that I loved, the people that I loved the love of being able to look out and see like just these beautiful sights just like this this moving thing I'm gonna go back to Iowa and go back to work and wake up to like regular everyday life but I'm I'm not gonna forget this for a while longer I think I'm gonna have these waves going for for a little while and I'm gonna just be thankful for the love that's like radiating inside me It's gonna take me a while before I can fully encapsulate this journey with words. It's been profound and moving and painful, at times bitter and frustrating wearing me down to my bones, just ready to, to quit and go home. And at the same time, it's been so beautiful and majestic and freeing and a reminder of the energy and life that is within me and I think that is within everybody. And that's always what I aim for when I go after a skate like this. I think that is one of the most important parts of it is when it brings me down to nothing to remind me that I'm full of everything I need, everything in the universe. Hi, I'm William J. Locker, and I am the musician slash songwriter slash cameraman for the music video Hook. And I'm Stefan Hansen, uh, originally from Denmark, now living in Des Moines, and I am the co-director and videographer for the music video Hook. 
called it hook because it was this hook I kept singing in my head even when I was writing other songs. That line, singing my song in front of everyone, that line always popped up. I'm like, I gotta use that someday. I kinda wanted to make a music video for it and put it out in the world. I've been traveling all day long and well, with the natural tempo of the song and the way it grooves, it kinda gave me almost like a catwalk feel. But that involves contacting a lot of people and a budget and time and so I'm always thinking like oh, that's a cool idea but what's another thing we could do that's more outside the box and maybe actually easier to achieve and um, Stefan got this fun 360 camera. One thing with working with Will and you know working with musicians for music videos um, to me, they're sort of, you know, a way to experiment with different techniques. You know, sometimes that might be an editing technique, sometimes that might be a lighting technique. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, a new piece of gear, uh, which in this case, we had a 360 video, you know, one of the ones where you can like look around um, as the video is playing. So it just kind of worked out too, like, well, this is gonna be a very Iowan video because of it sees everything around you. So I got the shot next to the Capitol with Heath on saxophone and sculpture garden with my wife Nella and out in the country with my dad's old 1954 cockshut tractor. <laughs> so it kind of challenged me and I think challenged Stefan a little bit too to make a fun video using that 360 technology.
Funding for the Film Lounge has been provided by... Produce Iowa, building a statewide network of support for the film community in Iowa. More information on how you can connect is available at produceiowa.com. And Iowa Arts Council, empowering Iowa to build and sustain culturally vibrant communities by cultivating creativity, learning, and participation in the arts. Learn more at iowaculture.gov.